What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley, and in this video I'm going to be talking about this book, The Bible Doctrine of Man, by John Laidlaw. It originated as the seventh series of the Cunningham Lectures, delivered in 1878 at New College, Edinburgh, the Free Church College as it was then. This is uh, a reprint. It was issued, uh, got my copy in 2006, and it was issued by my friend Phil Roberts of Tentmaker Publications. The question of what does it mean to be human is one that everybody has to face. And in the 19th century, in the Victorian era, when the Cunningham Lectures began, there were two great challenges to the Christian view of humanity. The first was the theory of evolution, the Darwinian hypothesis that mankind is not a special creation. There's no such thing as a special creation, but that all life forms evolved from lesser forms, so that humanity, in the Darwinian view, is on a continuum from the amoeba through up, well, probably to us. On the other hand, there was the great challenge of the realisation about of the greatness of the universe, which then led to the question, but what about other planets? And then there were those who... Again, in the 19th century, our understanding, our knowledge of other cultures was expanding rapidly, which led to the question, can we really say that the Christian doctrine is right and all others are wrong? And this in turn, these in turn led to the development of theological liberalism, which was an attempt, the other name is modernism, which is an attempt to try to fit Christianity into this evolutionary understanding of the world, among other things. And so it was that part of the point of the Cunningham Lectures was to have leading theologians from particularly the Free Church of Scotland, but also other churches, particularly other Presbyterian churches, to deliver these lectures dealing with vital points in theology and what can be more important than what is man that you are mindful of him. Now this was these were delivered by John Laidlaw, he's the author. John Laidlaw came from the, the area of Ettrick in the southern uplands of Scotland. People think of the Highlands and we think of the, the, the northern Highlands but there is this, this belt the southern uplands, just across the border. And Ettrick is one of the great, one of the most important places there. Ettrick was a, a centre for the, the, the Cameronians, the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland. As a denomination, they're almost extinct in Scotland today, although they are very active in Northern Ireland. And in the United States of America. But there's there's only a couple of congregations left in Scotland. And when we look at Scotland today, there's a it's a very strange thing to do because we look today and the, the free church is predominantly Highland. The the more conservative churches that the Free Church of Scotland, and of course now the Free Church continuing, the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, these tend to be more Highland. But in the 17th century, the Highlands were not very well evangelised, and the great leaders of the covenanting movement were in the, in the lowlands. The area around Ettrick is noted for its Cameronian churches, named for Richard Cameron, the Lion of the Covenant, the, the lead, one of the most radical leaders of the covenanters during the killing times of the 17th century. Now, after the killing times ended, when King William, when William and Mary come to the throne of England and Scotland, 
there is then a question before the Presbyterians, which is, do we accept the settlement that William and Mary are offering us, which was a settlement that would lead to the Church of Scotland becoming Presbyterian, the Presbyterians becoming the established church, and the Episcopalians becoming the dissenters? Or do we protest that this doesn't go far enough? Now, there were those, and the Cameronians are those, who said that the Revolution Settlement did not go far enough because it did not involve the Solemn League and Covenant becoming once again part of the, the polity of the Church in Scotland. And so the Cameronians remained outside. Initially, they had no ministers. They were society people. But later on, a number of ministers joined them. They formed a presbytery, and so they could ordain their own ministers. And as the 18th, as the, the 18th century went on, the Cameronians grew somewhat. They still remained a, a minority group, but they had congregations in various places over and through the lowlands. And of course they had congregations in Glasgow and Edinburgh. But it was predominantly a lowland group, of course, because that's where the Cameronians began. They went on through the into the 19th century, and they had some very noted theologians. The, the most notable being William Gould, who edited that great, vol great set of Owen that the Band of Truth publish. Well, John Laidlaw came from a Cameronian family. John Laidlaw's parents were Cameronians, and he was a, a very intelligent young man. He went to Edinburgh University, entered Edinburgh University. He was born in, in Edinburgh to this Cameronian family in 1832. In 1851, he, ed he entered the university, doing his uh, foundational course. He was preparing to be a minister in the Cameronian church. So he went through the arts course, and he so impressed the so impressed his professors that they put him forward for an MA when written otherwise he would have just had a, a BA but they, they found his dissertation so impressive that they put him forward and said no this is, this is an MA level dissertation so he was brilliant. He studied part time at the Reformed Presbyterian Divinity Hall, which was in Glasgow. And the two, two professors there, Professor Symington and Gould. Gould, of course, as I said, the editor of Owen. But in 1856, Laidlaw came to a decision that was to change the direction of his life, which was that the Free Church of Scotland was, in fact, the church that he should be a member of. So he resigned from the RPs and he became a free church student at New College, Edinburgh. So he continued training for the ministry, but for the ministry of a different church. This is a photograph of him towards the end of his life. And he, it's in his posthumous volume, Studies in the Parables and Other Sermons. When he finished his course, he spent part of 1858 in Germany studying. It was the fashion in those days to uh, students, particularly theological students, to go and spend a, a session or so in the German universities because Germany was seen as the, as the centre of particularly Protestant theological study. There were brilliant theologians in the German universities. The problem was that many of them were not at all orthodox. Nevertheless, Laidlaw went to Germany, he studied, and he seems to have concentrated on the, the more orthodox theologians, rather than the, the more unorthodox. In 1859, he, after he spent a period as an assistant in a, a church in Edinburgh, he was ordained 
to the Free Church in Bannockburn. Of course, Bannockburn is famous in Scotland. That's where Robert the Bruce wins his great victory over the English, ensuring Scottish independence and ensuring that when Scotland and England are united, it's in the 18th century, on very favourable terms, and it's a, a matter for the two parliaments to discuss. It's not a conquest, but it is a, a discussion between parliaments, that that union is not something that's forced upon Scotland by force of arms. So Bannockburn is this famous location. There's a free church, laid law, 1859. He is ordained there. And he remained there until 1863, when he was ordained, well, when he was rather transferred, he was only ordained once, he was transferred to the, uh, his call to the Free West Church in Perth. Perth, of course, you know, Bannockburn's a little place, Perth is a bigger city. It's one of the notable Scottish cities. And so he goes to Perth, to the Free West Church, and becomes noted as a preacher. His preaching was doctrinal preaching. He wasn't somebody who appealed so much to the emotions, there was that, but he particularly appeals to the mind. And he preaches doctrine. He's not interested in telling anecdotes, he's not interested in speaking to people about feelings, but rather to expound the Bible, to teach the doctrines of Scripture. The, the memoir appended to, to this is by Professor Mackintosh. The memoir, Professor Mackintosh writes, his point of view was what was called objective, and his method to a great extent doctrinal. He aimed at preaching not the soul in its ups and downs, but Christ in his unchanging grace. His knowledge of human life might be called profound, indeed, in a nature so quiet and almost shrinking. His firm treatment of many, a bewildering, of, of many bewildering, passionate problem, was something of a mystery. Yet in the main, his gaze was not inwards but outwards to the great object of the Christian faith. He was never guilty of the affectation, unpardonable in one who speaks to sinful men, of talking as if the truth of the gospel were an open question to be canvassed with a lofty, unprejudiced toleration. On the contrary, it was for him a fundamental axiom that in Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, once crucified but now raised to the majesty in the heavens, we have received a wonderful revelation of the Father's love, casting light enough for peace and joy on all things present and to come. He was a noted preacher. And in 1878... He was asked to give the Cunningham Lectures on the Bible Doctrine of Man. It's a, a wonderful work, and in it he deals with many of the questions at the time, the, the Germans, and problems in British Christianity in terms of teaching about man that were, was not true. But mostly it's an emphasis on the, the actual positive teaching of Scripture. It was largely on the strength of his Cunningham Lectures that when in, 18, in 1880 he was given a, the degree of Doctor of Divinity from the University of Edinburgh. In 1881 a vacancy occurred in the Free Church College, in New College, and initially Dr Gould was sounded out to see if he would be willing. He taught theology at the College of the Reformed Presbyterians. The RPs, the majority, five-sixths of them had joined the Free Church by this point. There was still a, a small number outside, and over the, the decades, sadly, it's become smaller and smaller. But Gould was one of those who joined the Free Church, and he was immediately sounded out, can we have the, the great Dr Gould to teach at New College? But Gould said, no, I, I can't do it. Um, and he recommended Laidlaw. Now, they, they knew Laidlaw from the, the lectures, and so Laidlaw was appointed in 1881 as the Professor of Divinity in New College. In 1890, he published a book, The Miracles of Our Lord. 
he became a noted figure in the Free Church. There were several points that were controversial about him. First of all, he became a supporter, in a sense at least, of the Keswick Convention and the peculiar doctrine of sanctification that Keswick in those days taught. But also, he spoke in favour of Robertson Smith being retained in the college. You know, Robertson Smith was a great heretic. I, I shall probably do a video on him at some point. He was a very, very arrogant young man who was appointed to teach Hebrew and Old Testament at the Free Church College in Aberdeen and caused all kinds of bother by his unguarded statements. But Laidlaw was one of those who said, well, we need to maintain academic freedom. As it turned out, of course, Robertson Smith managed to completely blot his copybook and squander all the goodwill towards him, and lost the post and ended up teaching at Cambridge, for which he was much better suited. Laidlaw struggled with depression, and between 1895 and 1897 he suffered chronic depression. Depression that left him hardly able to do his duties. He did recover for a time, but in 1904 ill health led to his resigning his post and he died on September the 21st, 1906. His final word was God gasped out as he died. But he's best known, or should be best known, for his Bible doctrine of man. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? That's the fundamental question that Christianity asks. But Christianity also has an answer. The Bible has an answer. The Bible speaks of how it is that man came into being, that God created man, humanity. The Bible gives an account of man's origin. We cannot ignore that fact. Now what does happen, of course, is that the question is asked, well, we know what it says, but what does it mean? And that's the obvious, obvious point. And Laidlaw himself, you know, he's a, a Victorian man, he's not entire... He, he writes, the Bible should not be committed to any theory of the origin of species. Now, many of us, myself included, disagree with that. But it's good to have someone who's intelligent, knows the scriptures, explaining that view, even if we disagree with it. One of the things that's very important, particularly for those who are ministers, those who are in mature Christians is that we should be able to read things we disagree with without damning the author to Hades for holding differing opinions even if we think those opinions are ruinous. The great question is what is man? Evolutionism is a doctrine. Creation is a doctrine. What is man? And he points out the error that evolutionists make when trying to account for civilization and religion. He says, when we come to account for civilization and religion, its method is at least equally paradoxical. It gives its primary and chief attention to those unfortunate branches of the human family which have hitherto failed to become civilized. Well, of course, that's a, that's a wonderfully Victorian way of putting things. <laughs> the Victorians spoke like that. Today, if you spoke like that in most circles, you would be hissed off the platform. You'd get cancelled. But Laidlaw makes a good point. Why is it that when trying to account for the, the rise of religion and civilization, people go and they, they look for those tribes that haven't developed very much in the way of material civilization? And we say, well, this shows an earlier stage in development. Why? There's the question. But where he's most interesting and most useful, I find, is in his talking about the question of man's nature. 
he wrote at a time when the tripartite view of man, you may have heard of it, the idea that the human nature is made up of three parts, body, soul and spirit, when the tripartite idea was one that had a great deal of prominence. J.B. Head is the, the notorious, he should be notorious, promoter of the idea of the tripartite nature of man. But Laidlaw emphasises, no, human beings are a unity. Now, it doesn't mean it's a unity that is indivisible, but first of all, we, we emphasise humanity is a human being, is a unity. So he says, the unity of man's nature, according to scripture, the meaning of Genesis 2-7 to a mind unprepossessed with theories is sublimely simple. It declares the Lord God formed the man, dust from the ground, and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here are plainly two constituents in the creation, the one from below, dust from the ground, the other from above, the breath of life, as the inspiration of the Almighty. Yet from these two facts results a unit. Man became an animated being. And there's the point. The, tri the problem with the tripartite concept is that it emphasises the diversity, but also it tries to take a number of uh, incidental passages and form them into, and makes them the absolute fundamental passages about what human, human nature is like. And then everything else is fitted into that. But the problem with the trichotomy is that when the Bible speaks of man, it speaks of man as having a physical element and a spiritual element. It doesn't usually, it doesn't explain what the spirit is, so that when we read body, soul, spirit, in those very few places it occurs, it's best to think of it not in terms of the of a technical definition, rather, but to think of it as popular language, as language that emphasises figures of speech. Because the duality of human nature is clearly expressed in Scripture. But when it comes to this trichotomy, we find ourselves faced with something that the Bible says so little about, that if trichotomy were, as, as J.B. Head imagined, central to the Bible doctrine of man. It would be laid out carefully, it is not. And we should be very careful basing our understanding of human nature upon speculation rather than upon the definite statements of Scripture. We don't speculate on unclear passages, but we emphasise the clear ones. So there we are, just a, a little taster of the Bible Doctrine of Man by John Laidlaw. It's a marvellous book and very helpful, as many of these early Cunningham lecture volumes are. Well, thank you for watching. May God help you in your study of the best books, and in particular the best book of all, the Bible.